Mr. Crawley, come in, come in. Dr. Proudy. And also Mrs. Proudy. Mr. Crawley. You are very punctual. Yes, despite the efforts of your footman. Oh? He was much bothered that I had no card, but I'm not bound, I think, to show people my name on a ticket. I can tell it to them just as easily. Yes, uh, of course. Now, um, do come and sit by the fire. Thank you, no. I am warm with walking. Walking? Where? Hither, my lord. From? Hogglestock. No, surely not. I don't see how you are in a position to deny it, my lord. But it is a matter of no moment. I'm here in obedience to your lordship's command. Yes. I hope your wife is well, Mr. Crawley. She suffers no special ailment at present, thank you. I'm so pleased. That is much to be thankful for. Mr. Crawley. Dr. Proudy. Will you not be seated, Mr. Crawley? Thank you, no. Oh. Uh, Mr. Crawley, this matter of the... Uh, this matter which came before the magistrates at Silverbridge... <laughs> It has been most unfortunate, has it not? It has, my lord. Indeed it has. I have felt for Mrs. Crawley very deeply. <clears throat> Far be it from me to express an opinion on the affair. It is uh, enough for me to know that the magistrates have heard the evidence. Most convincing <clears throat> evidence. <clears throat> they have heard the evidence, as I say, and have thought it proper to refer the case to a jury. And they were right to do so. Oh, well... Yes, probably. Of course they were right. At any rate, you are now accountable to the criminal laws of the land. Well, my lord, to such laws as there are, I suppose we are all accountable. But uh, you, Mr Crawley, are accountable in a very particular way, I think. You will not wish to be reminded what your present condition would have been had private friends of yours not stood bail for you. Well, my lord, I would have been in the condition of a man not guilty before the law. You would have been in prison, Mr. Crawley, on account of the fact that the magistrates believe you have stolen a cheque for twenty pounds. Well, that's as it may be. I have nothing to do with that side of the matter. Nothing whatever, my lord. Oh, but you have, Bishop. It is on account of that side of the matter, my lord, that you must take action. Prompt, firm action. The magistrate's decision demands it. This is the room of the private secretary to the chief commissioner of the income tax board. It's my room. You see, young Johnny Eames has come on a little since he was, well, very young and very raw. I am a man of some wealth, too, not by virtue of my work, but because of money that was left me by a certain Lord de Guest of Guestwick Manor. And there is one other thing which ought to be said about me. The most important thing. Excuse me, one moment. I believe that there's a prohibition against cigars at the income tax office, but in my view it can't possibly apply to a private secretary. That other thing, I'm in love. I have been in love with the same young lady, I mean, for many years. Have been as constant and faithful as any man could be expected to be, but with no joy. No sign from my beloved that she could love me in return or show me anything other than friendship. Well, it is a sad state of things, it's true. But I suppose I've had long enough to get used to it. The plain fact is, Mr Crawley, that at the next assizes you must go to the courthouse yonder and be tried for theft. Yes, my lord, if God grants me life and strength. Oh, you will be at the courthouse, Mr Crawley. The police will see to that. Now, I think you will agree, Mr Crawley, that this will be a most unseemly situation for a man of the church. Unfortunate was the word you used earlier, my lord, and that, I think, was better chosen. It is unseemly, very unseemly, at the very least. The bishop could have used a much stronger word, believe me, Mr Crawley. Well, given this uh, uh, um, situation and... 
uh, looking to the welfare of the diocese, and, let me say, your own welfare, too... And especially to the souls of the people of Hogglestock. Yes, yes, indeed. Mindful of these considerations, therefore, it occurred to me, and uh, to Mrs. Proudy... I will tell Mr. Crawley myself what has occurred to me. Yes, my dear, I'm sure you will, and Mr. Crawley, I know, will take it in good part. It occurred to... uh, me, as I say, that it would be expedient if you gave up your work as curate of the parish. But I indicated in my letter, my lord, that I'm not willing to do so. Well, yes, Mr. Crawley, but your letter perhaps was written in haste. Oh, it was, my lord. Your messenger, Mr. Thumble, was waiting to take it back to you. The letter was indecent. The letter was a disgrace. Just a moment, my dear. And so, sir, was your refusal to allow Mr. Thumble to preach from your pulpit as the bishop had instructed him. I tell you, Mr. Crawley, if I had been Mr. Thumble, I would have preached from your pulpit. I would indeed. <clears throat> I forget where I was. Oh, uh, yes, the letter. Um, y- you wrote it, and I, of course, received it, and... Uh, from reading it, Mr. Crawley, I was surprised to learn that you refused to submit to my authority in this matter. Hmm. Do you still refuse? I do, my lord, for I judge my duty to God to be greater than my duty to your lordship. Oh, and by what right, by what power do you exercise such judgment? By what right, sir? Answer me. Bishop... This man is willful. This man is insubordinate. My lord, my case has been sent for trial. This fact, on account of your ignorance of the theory of our law... Sir! This fact, I say, you seem to have misinterpreted as being suggestive of my guilt. Well, the jury may indeed pronounce me guilty. Of course they will. should such a verdict be given, my lord, your interference in my parish will be legal, proper and necessary. But until that time shall come, my lord, I shall have authority in Hogglestock. No! Just as you, my lord, have authority in Barchester. For you have no more power to turn me out of my church pulpit than I have to push you off your Episcopal throne. This is an outrage! And if you doubt me, my lord, your lordship's ecclesiastical court is open to you. Try the question there. So, you defy us then? You defy us? Well, sir, I warn you... Peace, woman! What did you say? Keep your peace, woman. Please. Woman. Woman. You should not interfere in these matters, Mrs. Proudy. You debase your husband's high office. My lord. Good day to you. Filthy things, these cabs. Mm. Are useful, though. Yes, Johnny. But just imagine what it would be like to have a carriage of your own. Well, I imagine it would be a great expense and a great nuisance. This fellow here, by the way, is a friend of mine who glories in the name of Conway Dalrymple. He's a painter. An artist, that is. We shared rooms once, but he's in Kensington now, having discovered fame and some fortune. Do you know our hosts at all? I know of them, Conway. Through you, no doubt. Mr. Broughton is very rich. Well, I suppose he must be. Works in the city, has horses at Market Harbour, a deuced good fellow. Keeps a good bottle of claret, which is a rarity these days. <laughs> oh, you're a connoisseur, are you? Barely three years ago, let me remind I'd you... I'd rather you did You drank nothing but beer and complained when the cost went up to threepence. What about Mrs. Dobbs Broughton? Ah, yes. Maria. Dear woman. Very beautiful. I've just finished her portrait. Painted her as a grace. From mythology, you know. Oh, yes. There were three of them, weren't there? There were. So I painted three Mrs. Dobbs Broughtons on the same canvas and picked up £600 for the privilege. Yes, she's very beautiful. And he's very rich. Conway, you naughty man, you're late. Oh, just a little. Sorry. Mrs. Broughton. This is Mr. John Eames, Ah. Private Secretary at the Income Tax Office. Very pleased to meet you, Mrs. Broughton. We have another eminent civil servant here this evening. Oh, yes? I'll introduce you in a moment. Now, Conway. Uh, Mrs. Broughton, I think I should be Mr. Dalrymple tonight, don't you? Oh, yes. Thank you. Mr. Dalrymple, you will be escorting Miss Van Siever to dinner. Of course. Uh, Johnny, Mrs. Broughton has suggested I do a portrait of the said Miss Van Siever. 
So I had to get to know her, you see. You, Mr. Eames, will be taking Miss Madalina Demolines. She is the daughter of Lady Demolines. Well, Mrs. Broughton, I will do my best to get to know Miss Demolines. But I won't paint her portrait. She wouldn't thank me if I did. <laughs> <laughs> ah, now there is the gentleman I spoke of. His name is Mr. Crosby. Mr. Crosby? Yes, let me introduce you. Uh, Mrs. Broughton, there is no need for that. Oh, you know him? Oh, how splendid. Mr. Crosby? Yes. I've brought a friend of yours. Oh, Mr. Musselborough, good evening to you. Mr. Eames. Mr. Crosby. How very glad I am to have the opportunity of shaking hands with you. It is some time since we last met. Yes, it is. Yes. Certainly it is. It was at Paddington Station, I believe. It was. Unfortunate business. Yes. But there are no hard feelings, Mr. Eames. I assure you. Now, before dinner begins... Yes, Lady Demolines, that is your place. Thank you. I shall, as it were, take you round the table. To my left is Mr. Musselburgh. You ask anyone in the city, they'll all tell you Broughton has capital. Musselburgh is a sort of partner in my husband's firm. And to his left is Mrs. Van Siever, who also has some involvement in the business, I believe. Thank you, but I won't ask anyone in the city. Mrs. Van Siever is a ghastly woman. But very rich. If I did, I wouldn't believe them. People in the city are the stupidest in the world. Now, next to her is Mr. Crosby, and next to him is Clara Van Siever, who is the ghastly woman's daughter. I have been photographed, of course. Of course, but I am very surprised you've not been painted. And to Clara's left is Conway. <laughs> that is Mr. Daldrimple. I suppose one gets painted at the instigation of one's father or mother. Or husband, perhaps? Or lover? Well, yes, but my father is dead and my mother hates paintings. Hates paintings? Yes, and painters. Oh. Then on Mr. Dalrymple's left... No, no, Mr. Broughton, I never put money on the horses. No, 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 no. ...is old Lady Demolines, and next to her is my husband. Oh, you should make an exception with my horses, Lady Demolines. You should indeed. And next to him is Lady Demolines' daughter. Dinner parties, in my view, should always be held in winter. Her name is Madalina, and she is conversing with Mr. Eames. At this time of year, dinners are so warm and comfortable... And people get to know each other so well. Yes, you could be right. I wonder whether you and I will get to know each other. Of course we will, Mr Eames. That is, if I'm worth knowing. Oh, there can be little doubt about that. <laughs> I saw you greeting Mr Crosby a little earlier. He is a friend of yours, I take it? Well, I... Uh... His marriage was a strange business, was it not? Yes, but we are not quite bosom pals, in truth. <laughs> So he has not told me all the particulars. His wife's been dead two years. Not as long as that, I think. Long enough, I would imagine, for him to be married again. I know her sister, Lady Amelia Gazaby. None of that family's married well, you know. And I heard from her that before Mr Crosby married Lady Alexandrina, he was engaged to another poor girl, and that he was almost the death of her, too. But Mr Crosby may not have told you much about her. No. No, he didn't feel the need of that. I thought you said you liked Broughton's claret. So I do. It's wonderful. I agree. But you didn't touch it. No. You see, I make it a rule never to have a fellow's drink if he praises it himself and shouts its price. And I make it a rule never to cut off my nose to spite my face. But he does stink of money, doesn't he? Spends more than he makes, I suspect. And um, with the claret, except it doesn't seem to spend it well. I mean, if one must flaunt one's gold, at least it ought to be the real thing. Mr. Crawley's descent upon the Bishop's Palace seems to have created something of a stir. Has it, Archdeacon? Oh, yes, Harding. Rumour is rife. Some swear that the Bishop took to his bed that very afternoon and has not got up. Since. Oh. <laughs> and as for the bishop's wife, she, it seems, is planning to have Mr. Crawley sent to Botany Bay. Oh. <laughs> Henry? Yes, Grandfather? You seem to have grown very quiet on us. Have I? Indeed, you have. Very quiet and very solemn. But 
Wine maketh merry, so the good book says. <laughs> <laughs> so, fill your glass, Henry. Come, it's the 1820 and there's no more left after this. In that case, let you and Grandfather... No, no, no. Harding and I have had our fair share of it over the years. Oh, we have. I'm very much obliged to it. So fill your glass, if you please. Very well. You know, Archdeacon, I can remember your father giving the order for that wine. A year or two after he became bishop, it was... Mm. Someone reckoned it was heady stuff, and your father said that the curates would drink it even if the rectors couldn't. <laughs> and the curates did drink it, and the rectors too, of course. <laughs> ah, dear, dear, when I think of those days... <laughs> pleasant days. Oh, most pleasant, sitting round the table playing cards. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it was regular practice at the palace, as I recall. And the dancing, too. Oh, the clergymen were the best dancers in Barchester. They were. <laughs> I wonder if your father's spirit ever comes back to the old house and sees how things have altered. <laughs> and if so... Whether he approves. Approves? Good heavens! Well, he never thought himself infallible. And I'm not sure, Archdeacon, that the changes aren't for the best. Mm. Some of us were very idle when we were young. I worked hard enough. Uh, yes, yes, you did. But uh, others, myself included, took it very easily. Oh, the work got done, Harding. And it got done a great deal better than it does now. Without the fuss, too. And men were men in those days, and clergymen were, uh, well, gentlemen. You've gone quiet again, Henry? Yes, I have rather. Forgive me. Are you not going out shooting? Well, Father asked if I'd care to, but I didn't. Mother. Yes, Henry. I shall be leaving tomorrow. Oh, so soon. Well, I said I'd stay for Christmas, and Christmas is now over. Well, yes, but even so, your grandfather is staying till Friday. I'm sorry, Mother. I have to be in town for a few days. Ah. And after that, I will be off to Allington. To Allington? Yes, Mother. Grace Crawley is there at present, and it is necessary for me to see her. I mean to ask her to marry me. Oh, Henry! And since this is my intention, I wish to ask her as soon as possible. Now, I owe it to her, and to myself, that she should not think I am deterred by her father's present circumstances. But would it not be reasonable for you to be deterred? No, I think not. It would be dishonest. It would be ungenerous. Now, I'm fully aware, of course I am, of the misfortune that has fallen upon her, and which will be mine also, should she become my wife, but I have thought about this matter a great deal, and I believe I'm right. Oh, dearest mother, I'm sorry if I grieve you. No, not me. Well, I'm sorry, too, if I grieve father, not least because he has threatened to stop my allowance. Oh, Henry, he is inclined to be headstrong and willful, it's true, but he is a good man. And he loves you. Think of all that he's done on your behalf. Oh, he has been good to me. And I, in turn, have been the dutiful son. But in this matter, I cannot obey him, nor should he ask me to. If Miss Crawley should become my wife, you will not refuse to see her, will you? Dearest Henry, if it were not for your father, I would bid you bring Miss Crawley here and I would try to be as a mother to her. And some day, I'm sure, I would love her. But, my dearest, if your father is headstrong, must you be headstrong too? Wait, be patient, for if you are not, I fear you will be ruined. Oh, she's a beautiful woman. Mrs. Broughton or Clara Van Siever? Oh, both, of course. But I was thinking about the latter, a fine young creature. Oh, well, someday, no doubt, she'll murder her mother or startle the world with some newly invented crime. <laughs> but until then... She'll do. For a picture, you mean? Yes. I've decided on the theme. The Nine Muses, with Miss Van Siever taking all the parts? No, Johnny. Look. I've done a sketch. It's the story of Jael and Sisera. Who? Tut, tut. Don't you read your Bible? Ah, dear. Not as often as I should. 
Some fellow seems to be catching it in the head with a long nail. Yes, that's Captain Cicero, asleep. And Miss Van Siever here, in the guise of jail, is wielding the hammer. I see. What about that vague shape behind her? Mm. That's Miss Van Siever's odious mother. She represents death. Of course. Who'll be playing the unlucky captain? Another odious creature. He was at the Broughton's dinner party. Not Adolphus Crosby. Ah, your bête noire. Yes. You never warned me he'd be there. I didn't know, dear fellow. Anyway, it's not him. I meant Musselburgh, Broughton's business partner. And has he agreed to have his portrait done? No, no, I haven't asked. And I won't. Miss Van Siever wouldn't allow it if she knew. She'd never drive a nail into such a base person as Musselburgh. So I wondered whether you might help me out. Me? Yes. If you wouldn't mind, you could sit for the captain's other bits, you see, and then I'd add Musselburgh's features later. Oh, well... well, Oh, splendid. uh... Thanks, Johnny. I'll make sure the nail's not too sharp. I'd be so grateful. We'll make a start this week sometime, shall we? I'm afraid not. I'm off to Guestwick tomorrow. Oh. What about today, then? Sorry, I'm visiting Miss Demoline's and her decrepit mother. Are you now? Well, I've been invited, and one must be civil, you know. Civil, indeed. You intend to flirt with her. With the daughter, I mean. Perhaps. Why shouldn't I? Well, Johnny, one reason is she's too dangerous to be flirted with. She wants a husband and doesn't much care how she gets one. And a second reason is a certain Miss Lily Dale. Or perhaps I'm mistaken about you and Miss Dale. Of course, you're always talking about this goddess from the country. You never stop. But I'm not at all sure you care about her. Not really. Oh, I see. Because I have a healthy appetite. Because I laugh sometimes. Because I'm not one to write long poems. Because I accept an invitation to visit Miss Demoline's. Because of these and other symptoms, you think I am not in love with Lily Dale. Well, it's possible you are, after a fashion. But, Johnny, you're like the fellow who's always going to write a book. He never does, and he never will, even though the intention was sincere enough at first. All the enthusiasm's gone, you see, but he's he's very patient under the disappointment, and he's still known as the man who's going to write a book. Someday. And you're the man who, someday, is going to marry Miss Dale. No, Conway. You're wrong. You mean you won't marry Miss Dale? In truth, I don't think I have a shell. But what I mean is... I intend to resolve the matter one way or the other. For your information, Conway, that's the reason for my trip tomorrow. I am planning to pay a call on Miss Dale. Oh, yes. I shall ask her, for the last time, whether she'll agree to be my wife. Henry's gone already without speaking to me. He left his love, Archdeacon, and said that it was useless staying as he knew he would only offend you. That is quite possible, for he seems determined to do so. No. The fellow is not only a fool, Susan, he is a cowardly cur who lacks the courage to face me and tell me what he intends. But he did tell you. Well, he gave you due warning, at least. And what was your response, Archdeacon? Mm. To threaten him with the loss of his income, which has only served to make him more determined. That's sheer nonsense. If he did lack courage, he has it in abundance now. Good heavens! What was I supposed to do? Hold my tongue and say nothing? Well, that might have been the wiser course. You'll not stop Henry's income, will you? Susan, I'll do almost anything to prevent that marriage. Give way, Archdeacon, please. Give way? Give way? No. (sighs) No, I tell you, Susan, if Henry marries Grace Crawley, he won't get another penny from me. I am afraid that the further London stretches, the further Mamma is willing to go. She thinks the air is so much better out here. Oh, distance is nothing to me, Miss Demolines. I'd have happily set off overnight to get here on time. Oh. But in truth, Porchester Gardens is not quite at the other end of the world. How is your mother? She is not well. Oh, dear. I hope she hasn't moved house in vain. She is never well when the wind is in the east. Then you should tell her it is in the west. (laughs) You enjoyed the Broughton's dinner party, did you? Yes, I did. Maria Broughton and I were once very close friends, you know. Though, of course, she is my senior by some years. Of course. A charming woman. And her husband is so good-natured. Oh, yes. I never liked anybody so much in my life. Mr Eames, you are being unkind. (sighs) I suppose you think he's, you know, and indeed he is. Indeed. He lacks the advantage of birth or manners or proper education... But all his acquaintances can see that, and they make allowance accordingly. Maria, I assure you, is fully aware of his deficiencies. 
If you asked her, she'd happily admit he's ignorant. Well, I don't think I will ask her. But she was always determined that she'd put up with it. That was very good of her. Yes, I think it was. I shall not tell you all her history. That's a shame. But there is no doubt that she has been used to better things. Mm. Being Mrs Dobbs Broughton can't be a bad kind of life, though. No, no, it has its attractions. But there is perhaps too much uncertainty about it. Life is always uncertain, Miss Emmeline's. Yes, Mr Eames. But money in the city, I feel, carries a particularly large element of risk. It seems to come and go so quick. As to going quick, all money does that, I find. Yes. But Mr Broughton's money is a speculation. It's not secure. So their life, you see, is like being inside a volcano. <laughs> not that they seem to mind. City people like Mr Broughton get so used to it, they start to enjoy it. And as for Maria, she seems to thrive on fevered excitement. But I do hope she doesn't try to take advantage of him. By spending too much money, do you mean? No, Mr Eames, I didn't mean that exactly. I was thinking more of her friendships with men, and particularly with Mr Conway Dalrymple. Oh, yes? Mr Eames, I want you to act now, before it is too late. Rescue the two of them from shame and dishonour. Maria, as I say, is so very fevered. Yes, I'm sure the fevered existence accounts for everything. But what exactly am I supposed to do? I have heard, Mr Eames, that Mr Dalrymple is intending to paint a picture of Clara Van Siever. Now, I will say nothing of Miss Van Siever herself, save that she is certainly the most unpleasant woman that I have ever encountered. <sighs> but I have also heard, Mr Eames, that your colleague intends to paint this picture at the home of Mrs Broughton. And then, dear Conway, she pleaded with me to plead with you and to urge you not to paint the picture, or at least not to paint it in Mrs Broughton's sitting room. For otherwise, she said, all sorts of mischief might result. I told her I didn't quite understand the difficulty, since Miss Van Siever and Mrs Broughton would effectively chaperone each other. But I promised her I'd warn you of the danger. And I'd have done so in person, had I not arranged to be leaving town the following morning. By the by, when I was at Paddington Station... To Guestwick, please. First class. ...and was buying my ticket... First class to Guestwick, please. I noticed that there was a gentleman alongside me who had the same destination. Now, Guestwick is not quite Liverpool or Manchester. So when, several minutes later, I found myself in the same compartment as this fellow, I ventured to ask him if he had been to Guestwick before. No. No, I never have. Ah. I live there for the greater part of my life. Indeed. And I can tell you, it's the dullest little town in all England. <laughs> uh, well, in fact, I will not be staying in Guestwick. Very wise, sir. Very wise. And that was as much conversation as we managed for a while. We each read our newspaper, and then we read each other's. And after that... Since you have resided in Guestwick, sir, perhaps you're also familiar with a village called Allington. Allington? Yes, certainly. You don't by any chance know a lady by the name of Mrs Dale? Indeed I do. I know her very well. Are you intending to see her? I am. May I ask if you are an acquaintance of hers? I am not. I've never had the pleasure of meeting her. Ah. I thought, perhaps, because you were asking after her... I intend to call upon her, that is all. I tell you, Conway, my immediate thought was that this fellow was a friend of Crosby's and had been sent by him to talk with Lily and to act as Crosby's ambassador. I did not give voice to my fears, however, and we said no more except farewell when the journey was over and we went our separate ways. But that same afternoon when I paid a call on Lady Julia de Guest. She is the sister of my great benefactor, you know. When, as I say, I visited Guestwick Manor, I was to discover a little more about my travelling companion. I also came in for something of a surprise, for I had not supposed that I would see Lily Dale quite so soon. My dear John, come and join our little party. Thank you, Lady Julia. Lily? How are you, John? I'm well, thank you. Grace, how good to see you. And you. Oh, this is very pleasant. Uh, I had no idea. Of course not, but I'm so glad you've come, John. Particularly if you've brought my spectacles. Uh, my pockets are crammed with spectacles. <laughs> I am Lady Julia's errand boy, you know. <laughs> Here we are. Three pairs from Dolan's. Also, 
your pills from Jones's. Thank you. And some wool from that shop in Regent Street. But the blue, they said, isn't quite the blue that you asked for. Oh, no, it isn't what I asked for at all. So it'll have to go back? If you wouldn't mind. (laughs) And do you bring news from London as well as its wares? No, Lily, I I don't think so. Have you been to no grand balls or dinner parties? Oh, heavens, I'm at them every day. (laughs) That's hardly news. Ah, but I tell you what, I travelled down here with a fellow who's visiting the small house. Really? Mama never said anything, did she, Grace? I don't believe so. What is his name? I haven't the remotest idea. He's about my age, pleasant appearance, used a monocle when he looked out of the carriage window. Oh, do you know who it might be, my dear? Yes, Lady Julia. It is Major Grantly, is it not? Yes. Major Grantly. Oh, I've heard of him. He's son of the old Archdeacon, I believe. I don't know about old. I wonder what he's doing at Arlington. And, of course, Dr Grantly, the Archdeacon, is the son of the former Bishop of Barchester. There was talk of making the son a bishop also. What, the same man who's now a major? No, you goose, Dr Grantly. The major doesn't look like a bishop's son. What does a bishop's son look like? Well, he has a sort of clerical tinge Uh about him. (laughs) Not this fellow, though. Ah, but this fellow, as you call him, is only the son of an archdeacon. Oh, of course. That accounts for it. (laughs) Lady Julia, you must forgive us, but I fear that Grace and I will not be stopping for tea. Nonsense, my dear. You promised. I know, but we must break our promise. Mustn't we, Grace? It is Major Grantly. I'm certain of it. Yet it seems so unlikely. Well, if he has come, I am very glad. It shows he has a heart inside him and true nobility. I tell you fairly, Grace, I shall expect a great deal from you now. In what way? In the way of worshipping him. Yesterday I might have scorned the man for abandoning you, but now it seems to me he is un chevalier sans peur et sans reproche, and you must go down on your knees before him and kiss his shoe buckle. (laughs) I shall not be content, dear Grace, that you should merely love him. The world has turned against your father. If, therefore, Major Grantly has chosen this very time to ask you to marry him, then I think you will owe him more than love. Well, in truth, I will give him more than love. Lily, I want to do him all the good I can. And so, if he asks me to be his wife, I know what I must do. I must refuse him. Lady Julia... I had another reason for my journey. Apart, I mean, from wishing to see you. I was intending to ask Lily to marry me. Good, good. No, Lady Julia, no, I've been a fool. That's clear enough. My dear John, this afternoon was hardly the time. Of course it wasn't. But you could see that there's no hope for me. That's nonsense, John. (laughs) Lady Julia, she ran away almost the moment I came in. Yes, but I think it was on Grace's account, not her own. Something to do with the fellow on the train. No, no. I don't believe it. She was glad enough to go. The plain fact is, she wants nothing to do with me. Now, that is untrue. What little chance I had was lost last year when Crosby's wife died. Well, I will confess that Lily has become somewhat troubled since then. Yes, and so have I. For my part, I wish Lady Alexandrina could have lived forever. Or that her husband had died in her place. Now, John... I saw him again recently. Did you indeed? He had the impertinence to come up and shake hands with me. Lady Julia, if he ever ventures to show himself within ten miles of Arlington, I'll want to know about it. I gave him a good thrashing once, but next time I'll see if I can't do even better. But, John, if you were to make Lily your wife... If... That surely would be a better way of thrashing Mr Adolphus Crosby. It, it would. It's true. Courage, John. You'll win through yet. I must refuse him, Lily. I must. How can I let him sacrifice himself? But there will be no sacrifice. He will be seeking what he wants. Oh, but if he were, if no sacrifice were involved, how could he be the noble chevalier you were talking of? Lily, he does not truly want to marry me. I know it. He is willing to do so, perhaps, for my sake. But for his sake, I will not permit him. And yet you love Major Grantly, do you not? Yes. I make no mystery about that. I love him so well that I will not let him suffer. Lily, listen, you do not know his father. His father? Well, in truth, I do not know him either. But he is rich and proud. I know that much. 
And he's of high position in the world. And the sister, Griselda, is married to Lord Dumbello. What difference does that make? I wouldn't care if she was married to the Prince of Wales. Well, Grace, we are back home. Yes. If he is here, you must talk with him. Alone. Must I? Oh, yes. I think you owe your noble knight that much at least. There is a visitor. Yes, Mama, we thought there might be. Oh? His name is Major Grantly, is it not? Yes. Do you like him, Mama? I think I like him very well. I hope you've not been inconvenienced, Mrs Dale. Not at all, my dear. But, Lily, how did you know about Major Grantly? I will tell you all about it, Mama, while Grace is with the Major. The trial is a mere six weeks away. And I fear it. The courage that I showed towards the Proudies, if courage it was, the bravado at least, that has quite gone. In the dark hours, I tremble and weep. I call upon God to take my life and spare me this terrible ordeal. Mary, I think I will go up to London. Go up to London? Why? Well, people keep on telling me that I should consult a man of law, and I begin to tire of hearing it, so I shall consult a man of law and see what good it does. Oh, my dearest, it will do you a great deal of good, I'm sure. But why go to London? Because, Mary, the matter's become such common talk in these parts. I could not endure to go to a local man, so I will travel to London. I will introduce myself to your cousin, Mr. Toogood of Gray's Inn. That is an excellent notion. Indeed, I believe I may have mentioned it to you some time ago. Of course, I cannot pay him. Oh, Josiah, you need not speak of that. But I must speak of it, not least to him. I will go to your cousin and... Though it will be hard, I will humble myself before him. There need be no humbling, Josiah. Well, I will do it nonetheless. I will humble myself, I will tell him my story. And it is possible, Mary, that he will say some words to me that are of some use. Oh, I am certain that he will. But, Josiah, perhaps... Perhaps I should go, not you. No, no, I am aware that I am weak in mind where you are strong, that I grow mad where you are clear-witted. Josiah. But I do not wish you to do my work. I do not wish folk to say, look, the fellow is incapable. No, it may indeed be true. Mary, I tell you, I fear it more than prison. Truly, I do. Fear what? The madhouse. Josiah. They'd send me there soon enough if they couldn't jail me. She would. Certainly, that she-wolf, wife of the so-called bishop. I shall leave for London tonight by the mail train. Very well. You'll find my cousin a kind man, Josiah. And if I do? Well, bear it with patience. If you can. Ill usage and cruel words, such as Mrs. Proudy offered, you can repay with interest. But kindness, I fear, may be a heavier burden. I hope you are not angry with me for coming to see you. Oh, no, I'm not angry. You must know, I think, why I am here. <laughs> Forgive me. I had no right to make such a remark. Let me tell you why I'm here. Grace, I have come to ask you to be my wife. It has all been very sudden, I know, very abrupt. But no other way has been open to me. Can you give me no answer, Grace? You are very kind. I would be more than kind. <laughs> well, yes, and so you are. Kind is a cold word when used to such a friend at such a time. I would thank you if I knew how. <laughs> My heart is full of thanks, it is, truly. And is there no room in your heart for love? No. Not as things are at home. All the love I have is for my father and my mother. Oh, yes. But when that dreadful business is past, Grace, I am not pressing you as to a day. I only ask you to say that you will be engaged to me. 
No, Major Grantly, it cannot be so. Do you mean that you refuse me altogether? Yes, altogether. But why? Why? I should not have to answer that question. All I will say is that my family is disgraced. And that I will not take that disgrace into your family too. Oh, Major Grantly, my father has no money. He has been charged with stealing, and they say he will be found guilty and sent to prison. How can I be engaged to you in such circumstances? Well, I tell you fairly, I regard you as already engaged to me. No. No, you are wrong. You have told me that you love me. I have never told you so. Oh, not in words, perhaps, but in other ways. Grace, you are my own. No. You are. You are indeed. God bless you. Dearest Grace. Yes, twelve children living I have, Mr Crawley, and not a sick chick among them. You are most fortunate. I am, in very truth, Mr Crawley. I think of that sometimes, though perhaps not as much as I ought to. But the best way to be thankful is to use the goods that the gods provide, eh? <laughs> of course, I can't give the dear things castles and parks, but... I pay a good deal for their schooling. Sir, the picture you give of your home is very pleasant. Educate, educate, educate. Those are my three priorities. Well, not many of us would argue with you on that point, Mr. Toogood. There's not a girl in Tavistock Square that can beat my Polly at the piano, and Peggy has read Lord Byron all through. Sir, as your time is no doubt precious... Uh, oh, at ten o'clock, you know I'm not too rushed. And besides, one doesn't catch a cousin every day. However... You'd like to set two... Very well. <clears throat> Just tell the story in your own way, Mr Crawley, and I won't say a thing until you've done. That's uh, always the best, I find. Well, Mr Toogood, before I do tell my story, I must first draw your attention to an unfortunate fact. And uh, what, pray, is that? I come before you in former pauperis. I have no money to offer you for your service. Mr. Crawley. Nor do I know whether your charity will grant me what Please, I Please, no, 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 no. Don't let's have any more of this. We don't want this kind of thing at all. If I can be of service, I will. Mrs. Crawley is my cousin, <laughs> sir, and I am as likely to send a bill to my own wife as I am to yours. I felt it necessary to be explicit, Mr. Toogood. Well, you have been explicit with a vengeance. Now, heave ahead. Conway is due here any minute, and so is Clara Van Siever. And if Clara is willing, Conway is to start on the picture here in my own sitting room. Oh, but it is wrong, I think. It is wrong and foolish. But you see, I, I suggested it from the best and most unselfish of motives, to bring Conway and her together and by doing so to end this excess of friendship that he feels towards me. Oh, but what if the plan should fail, should fail so wretchedly indeed that he and I grow closer together than we were before? Oh, and what, on the other hand, if the plan should succeed? What if... What if he and Clara should marry and I should lose him forever? Oh, no. Oh. Mrs. Broughton. Conway. Good morning. How are you? She's not arrived yet, I see. No, Conway. Oh, well, you and I can talk. We can. Indeed, we must. The truth is, I hope Miss Van Siever does not arrive. <laughs> that would be good for our tete-a-tete, -tete, my dear Mrs. Broughton, but it might not bode well for my picture. I have been thinking about this matter, Conway, and I have decided I do not approve of it. <laughs> but that's nonsense. How can you not approve of it? It was your idea in the first place. Yes, and I regret it very much. Well, I shall regret it much more if the plan is dropped. I've become quite excited about this picture, and I mean to do it. Look, if it's anything to do with Miss Van Siever, I can assure you I have no interest in the lady aside from painting her. Well, I wish you had. I do indeed. You really want me to marry her? Yes, Conway, yes. In my view, marriage would give you a stability in life which it greatly needs at present. <laughs> and must I marry Miss Van Siever if I do not love her? 
No, Conway. I would not ask you to do that. Well, then, my dearest Mrs. Broughton, it cannot be. For as you know, Carissima, my heart is not free to present itself at Miss Van Siever's feet. But it ought to be free. But it is not. It must be free. It must. Make it so, Conway. Before it is too late. Well, Mr. Crawley, it is a sorry tale. Yes, yes, it is. Tell me now, did you employ a lawyer when you were before the magistrates? I did not. Hmm. Then I must be allowed to say you were wrong there, Mr. Crawley. But that's in the past. You must, of course, employ a lawyer at your trial. To tell lies in my behalf, you mean? To browbeat witnesses and shed false tears? Oh, come now. My innocence is so doubtful, you think, that it cannot be established without a lawyer's mercenary skill? Mr. Crawley, please. Mr. Crawley, you must have a lawyer. But I cannot, Mr. Toogood, even if I wish to. I cannot pay him. Nevertheless, you must have a lawyer. Not to do so would be an act of madness. Madness? Would it indeed? Mr. Crawley, I will carry the case through for you. Out of your own pocket? Never mind that. Uh, forgive me, but I must mind it. Mr. Toogood, you must not think me ungrateful. Though I might think you stubborn. Your offer is very kind, but I cannot possibly accept it. <sighs> you referred to the Dean of Barchester in your account, and to his wife. His name is Arabin. They're both abroad at present. Hmm. You wouldn't object if I wrote to them, would you? If they have an address. Well... You see, this business of the gift they made to you, the fifty pounds in notes, I just wonder whether it might have a bearing on the case. And I tell you something else, Mr Crawley. I am very fond of cathedrals. I am indeed, and I have long wanted to see the one at Barchester. It has a very fine example of a... Uh, uh, what do you call it, I believe? So, as I was always promising myself that I would go to Barchester, I think I will do so quite soon. Oh, Clara, dear, come and sit down. Thank you. A uh, pleasure to see you again, Miss Van Siever. How kind. Clara, this mad painter here declares that he will have your likeness in oils, whether you are willing or no. Hmm. But if I am unwilling, I'm sure he would never do such a thing. Assuming he were able... As to the being able, Miss Van Siever, let me show you this sketch. Oh. Captain Cicero, slain by jail. Ah. What do you think, Mrs. Broughton? Oh, it's clever. Very clever. Don't you agree, Clara? I'm not a judge in these matters. Mm, you can see the woman's fixed purpose mm. and her stealthiness, too. Mm. What is that dim outline in the background? Oh, nothing in particular. This is just the subject for you, Conway. So much action and drama, and yet such scope for portraiture. Oh, it's marvellous. Thank you, Mrs. Broughton. But Mr. Dalrymple could do this painting, could he not, without putting me in it? Uh, he could. But I won't. To my mind, Miss Van Siever, you and the subject matter are inextricably joined. I take that as no compliment, I assure you. None was intended, but artists throughout the ages, Miss Van Siever, have sought the best models when they have painted violent or criminal women. Lesser types have sufficed for the Madonnas and the St. Cecilias. People would know that it was me. Well, if no one knew, then it would be a very poor likeness. But what would it matter that they knew? We're not proposing anything improper, are we, Mrs. Broughton? Oh, no. There is Mamma to consider. She won't like the painting at all. Ah, uh, she won't. But your mother, Clara, is so very... singular, is she not? You cannot comply with her in everything. That is true. I don't see why it can't be kept a secret from her. Oh, I do. She's bound to find out, Mrs. Broughton, if your husband knows. Then my husband will not know. Not at first, at least. I'm sure we can all be a little bit devious. <laughs> the man must be punished. The man must be crushed. Well, my dear, Mr Crawley will certainly be punished if the court case goes against him. Yes, Bishop, but that is still weeks away. And meanwhile, that defiant, disobedient curate remains free and his deliberate flouting of Episcopal authority goes unchecked. Oh. Bishop, 
All the weight of the palace must be used against him. And at once. But... Don't tell me that you cannot do it, Bishop. For I know that you can take proceedings in ecclesiastical court yeah. under the Church Discipline Act. No, no, no. There must be an inquiry first. But there has been an inquiry and Mr Crawley was committed. That was civil law, which doesn't signify. I really do think, since it has gone so far, that it would be best to await the outcome of the trial. No. Oh. Ten thousand times no. Are you not aware how shamelessly he treated you? Mm. Are you not aware of the gross, gross insolence which he showed towards me? I have never been so insulted since I first came to this palace. Never, never. Oh, dear. And, of course, we know the man to be a thief. Think, Bishop, of the souls of the poor people of Hogglestock. Think of them. The only action that can be taken is to set up a commission. Then set one up. And the commission would take three months, I expect, to reach a verdict. Three months? Mm. Why should they take more than three days or, or three hours? The matter is all cut and dried. Indeed it is. Bishop, I will not rest until that offensive, blasphemous man is dealt with. He must be silenced. He must be relieved of his duties. He must be stripped of his clerical gown forthwith. <laughs>